Welcome to the Oral Health Care Skills Web Series number six of seven, Infection Control. I'm your facilitator, Mary Lou Vanderhorst, from the Regional Geriatric Program Central in Hamilton, Ontario. I would like to welcome the presenter, Kelly Vogel, from the Halton Region Health Department in Oakville, Ontario. Hello. And knowledge broker, Terry Kirkpatrick, from the Senior Health Research Transfer Network in Ottawa, Ontario. Hello. We ask that you note several items. First, no photos in this presentation may be copied, but permissions may be requested. Secondly, this is an educational presentation to be used for learning purposes, and users of this information are responsible for adaptation of this information to their practice and work environment. We have made every effort to provide you with accurate, evidence-based, and useful information. Finally, we thank Sherton, Halton Region, and RGPC for their contributions to make possible the Oral Health Care Skills Web Series. Kelly Vogel will now present Series 6, Infection Control. When you look at this picture, it highlights the reality that it is not always possible to tell what diseases a person may have from looking at them. For this reason and others, routine practices must be applied to everybody. Body fluids are exposed during oral care, like saliva, respiratory particles. So it is important that routine practices are practiced with every person even more so when doing oral care. Pathogens are unseen to the naked eye. The residents may be unaware that they have an infectious disease or cannot communicate it if they do know. There are five main routes of transmission. Today we will briefly discuss three. Contact transmission, droplet transmission, and airborne transmission. Contract transmission the most important and frequent mode of transmission for healthcare associated infections is divided into direct and indirect transmission. Direct contact transmission involves a direct body surface to body surface contact and physical transfer of microorganisms between an infected or a colonized person, such as what can occur when a healthcare provider provides oral care. Indirect transmission involves contact between a susceptible host and usually a contaminated inanimate object, such as a denture brush. Droplet transmission occurs when droplets are generated from the source person, primarily during coughing, sneezing, talking, and during the performance of certain procedures, such as oral care. For airborne transmission, this occurs by dissemination of either airborne droplet nuclei, small particle residue about five millimeters or smaller in size, of evaporated droplets containing microorganisms or dust particles containing the infectious agent. Routine practices is the system of infection prevention and control practices that is used during all care with all patients, residents, or clients to prevent and control transmission of microorganisms in a healthcare setting. To achieve proper infection control, there are certain practices that are in place. Routine practices and additional precautions replace the older term of universal precautions. Universal precautions referred mainly to blood-borne pathogens, but routine practices and additional precautions include pathogens found not only in blood, but in any body fluid, secretions, mucous membranes, and non-intact skin. Additional precautions are necessary in addition to routine practices certain pathogens. These precautions are based on the method of transmission, for example, contact droplet airborne precautions or a combination such as droplet contact precautions. 
a risk assessment should be done with every patient, resident, or client. A risk assessment is an evaluation of the interaction of the healthcare provider, the client, resident, or patient, and their environment to assess and analyze the potential for exposure to infectious diseases and identify the strategies that will decrease exposure risk and prevent the transmission of microorganisms. Some people cannot communicate with the oral care provider so that the risk assessment can be done. This is why everyone is always assumed to be infectious. Therefore, we always use routine practices. So it doesn't matter if a person can communicate or not. Routine practices is always used. So what can constitutes as routine practices when doing oral care? First and foremost is practicing proper hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is the single most important procedure in preventing the spread of infection. So the four moments for hand hygiene in healthcare are before initial patient or patient environment contact, before a septic procedure, after body fluid exposure, risk, and after patient, patient environment contact. Hands should also be cleaned before touching a resident or anything in the resident's environment, such as their oral hygiene tool. This act protects you as a caregiver and the resident and their environment from germs on your own hands. When using gloves while providing oral care, it is important not to touch the taps and sinks and bed rails with a gloved hand. So when doing the oral care, prepare all the tools that you will require in advance and place them close to you so that you won't touch other items in the resident's room unnecessarily. And this will then minimize the transfer of microorganisms. Hand hygiene can be done by washing your hands with soap and water for at least 15 seconds or by using an alcohol-based hand rub applied for at least 15 seconds to cover your hands. If the hands are not visibly soiled, then an alcohol-based hand rub is the preferred method for decontaminating the hands. However, if the hands are visibly soiled, washing with soap and running water must be done. This should be done before and after oral care is complete with each and every individual and in-between resident. If your hands are exposed to body fluids such as saliva, wash your hands immediately after exposure. Wearing gloves, while important, is not a substitute for hand hygiene. Rather, it should be used as an adjunct to hand hygiene. If there is a risk of the healthcare worker's hands being in contact with blood, body fluids, just saliva or non-intact skin, mucous membranes, then gloves should be worn. Hands should be cleaned before and after gloving. Gloves provide an additional protective barrier between the healthcare worker's hands and the resident's secretion thus reducing the transfer of microorganisms between the patient and the healthcare worker. Gloves should be disposed of in the garbage. A mask and eye protection should be used by a healthcare provider to protect the mucous membrane of the nose, mouth, and eyes when it is anticipated that oral care activity is likely to generate splashes or sprays of blood, body fluids, secretions, or excretions within two meters of a coughing patient, client, or resident. It is up to each healthcare provider to make a decision 
based on the individual risk assessment as to what uh, personal protective equipment is required for them to wear when performing oral care. Bacteria and viruses may survive for weeks or months on dry surfaces in the environment of the resident and may also be touched by the healthcare provider when providing care. Therefore, it is important to clean and disinfect services once the oral care is complete. Cleaning and disinfecting products must be approved by environmental services, infection prevention and control, and occupational health and safety. They must have a drug identification number or DIN number from Health Canada. They must be compatible with the items and equipment that are to be cleaned and disinfected. And they must be used according to the manufacturer's recommendation. Disinfectants that are chosen for use in, in health care should be active against the usual microorganisms encountered in the healthcare setting. Ideally require little to no mixing or diluting. Be active at room temperature with sh a short contact time and have low irritancy and allergenic characteristics and be safe for the environment. So those are the criteria for the disinfectant. Remember that cleaning and disinfecting surfaces that have been contaminated during oral care when you're finished is a must. These are some tools used for oral care. There are certain times in which an oral care item should be discarded for the purpose of infection prevention. For example, if any oral care item that is going in the mouth, such as a toothbrush, or that will come directly in contact with something that will go in the mouth, such as a denture brush, it will come in contact, direct contact with the denture. So if these brushes were to fall on the floor, then they should be discarded. Another example is after a resident or a client or patient recovers from an illness, such as the cold or the flu, the oral care items should be discarded. So this includes the denture cup, the denture brushes, and the toothbrush. Denture cups can also harbor bacteria and fungus if they are not cleaned well and regularly. Therefore, when cleaning denture cups, care should be taken to thoroughly clean the box every day the box should be emptied of the solution that the denture was soaking in overnight and rinsed and dried thoroughly. Often missed when cleaning denture boxes are the ridges that are on the lid. It's very important to clean these also and make sure that they are dry. Dishwashers can also be used to clean denture cups. Denture cups can be viewed as any other utensil as long as the dishwasher has met the approved food safety regulations by having a sanitizing cycle, then this is adequate. It must have a wash and rinse cycle and be able to sanitize through the use of hot water or chemicals in the final rinse. It is important that all the oral care tools are labeled with the individual's name on it. This will ensure that if it is misplaced, then the correct toothbrush or denture box or denture is matched up with the correct individual. Cloths are used for oral care to cleanse the mouth of debris and liquid and to drape across the individual's chest. Ideally, for use in the mouth, a disposable cloth is preferred. However, some homes and facilities prefer to use a cloth that is not disposable. If a non-disposable cloth, such as a towel, is used for the oral care, it should be placed in the appropriate bin to be washed once the oral care is complete. 
Regarding infection control, it is good to consider where the oral care items should be stored. If the toothbrush or the denture brush are being stored in a container that allows it to dry, they should be placed with the head or the bristles up. Okay, very similar to what you see in this picture. The bristles are not facing into the cup. These items should not be sealed in a bag. They should, be not, they should also not be stored with any other items, such as hair brushes or comb. This container should not be stored near a toilet, as the aerosols that are created when flushing may land on the toothbrush. And a wet brush is a perfect breeding ground for bacteria. As a suggestion, it may be best to store that container in a cupboard in the bathroom if that is available. If it is in the cupboard, though, it should not be touching anything else. If an electric toothbrush is used, it should be rinsed thoroughly and be, and al be allowed to dry. If a bathroom is shared by more than one resident or an individual, it is important to store each person's oral care item separately. For this reason and others, labeling the oral care items with the person's name on it um, and storing it separately is not only helpful, but is important in preventing the spread of infection. So you want to always remember that routine practices applies when doing oral care. Bacteria, fungi, and viruses can and do live in the mouth. It is important to practice proper hand hygiene. And while wearing gloves is not a substitute for hand hygiene, they should be worn while doing oral care in addition to hand hygiene. Oral care items should not be stored with other personal care items such as combs and brushes or medication. They should not be stored with anyone else's brushes and they should be allowed to dry and they should also be labeled. Thank you. These are a list of additional resources that you may want to reference on infection control standards. You will notice on slide 18, there is a reference to the Provincial Infectious Disease Advisory Committee, PIDAC. There is also a reference for the oral health link at Halton and the HOHO link. Thank you. I would like to thank Kelly Vogel for the Series 6 Infection Control presentation. I am your facilitator, Mary Lee Vanderhorst, and along with Kelly Vogel and Terry Kirkpatrick, our knowledge broker, we invite you to watch one of the other six oral health care skills web series. Series 1, Venture Care. Series 2, Tools of the Trade. Series 3, Oral Health Assessment. Series 4, Basic Oral Care, Series 5, the two toothbrush techniques, and Series 7, Oral Hygiene Care Planning. For more information and resources, we recommend that you go to any of the websites listed on pages 2 or 3 of this presentation. <laughs>